I know this much is true stars Mark Ruffalo as twin brothers grappling with trauma and mental illness. It has the most stellar cast on TV, including this person who I'm about to speak to, Archie Punjabi, Emmy winner Archie Punjabi. I'm Rob LaCuria, Senior Editor at Gold Derby. Now, Archie, I'm a little concerned about you because, um, sorry, my phone's ringing. I'm a bit concerned about you because on the same night, you had Mark Ruffalo yelling at you, and then you had Don McGlesey throwing you out of a window. What on earth did you do wrong to deserve that kind of treatment? You know, I think a lot of actresses would um, feel very envious of me. Um, I, think, I guess I just have that look, I have that face. I mean, I kicked around so many people on The Good Life as Kalinda Sharma for six years, and maybe this is payback time. Yeah, it probably is payback time, but you know what? What it reminds me of is, um, like you've been working for quite some time and it just goes to show how different so many of your roles are. And so let's kind of explore these two roles because they're quite different. Firstly, the HBO Limited series, I know this much is true, um, that you play a, like, I guess you'd call her a therapist. Mm -hmm. She's very controlled. She's very reserved. Um, when you signed on to that project, were you familiar with the novel by Wally Lamb? I was aware of it. Um, a few of my friends had told me about it. It was on my list, but as you know, it's an um, incredibly long book. So it was something I had intended to read. Um, and then once I was told about the project, I immediately got a copy of it and, and read it. Yeah. And then um, I was also thinking, without giving too much away, because I think we're only kind of halfway through it on on air, even though I've seen all of it, I'm lucky enough to have seen all of it, um, without giving it away, when it explores some really tragic things, right? And there's, there's some of those things are quite difficult to watch. And as we, as I mentioned earlier, there's a lot of scenes with you, where you're in the room with Mark Ruffalo's character. Were there any scenes in particular that you found quite difficult to shoot, that you found difficult to kind of wash off at the end of the day? Well, I think the person that found if anybody was going to find it hard to wash up at the end of the day, it's probably Mark Ruffner would be, um, you know, in having to play those two different yeah. twins. Uh, but the scenes were, I mean, they do deal with so many, this, this man goes through so much tragedy. And there's a couple of scenes when I am, when Dr. Patel is counseling him, that Mark's performance in it was so raw that even playing a counsellor who is as guarded as and um, as controlled as Patel, it was quite hard to not let that guard down a few times. And she does get occasionally emotionally affected by what he's saying. I'm thinking of the scene that was just on last week um, mm -hmm. when he talks about Thomas and he talks about the death of his um, child. The way Mark delivered that was just so powerful. It, it did take me a few minutes after we finished the scene to just compose myself. Yeah, and the beauty of Dr. Patel is. Um... She's, so, she's the complete opposite to Dominic and she's, it's a really interesting dynamic because she isn't phased by his outbursts. She, well, she probably is, but she's so super controlled and zoned in on what he's saying, which is what therapists are supposed to do. And I was wondering, um, I don't recall if you've ever played that kind of role before, but if, even if you haven't, what were you trying to do to prepare for someone who's super controlled and who has to be kind of there for the health of that other person? Well, I think one of the challenging aspects of playing Dr. Patel after I read the book was how does any counsellor, even the most experienced counsellor in the world, deal with a patient that has gone through so much tragedy in his life over the past 40 years? And when I spoke to um, a handful of counsellors, their reaction to when I told them what this character had gone through was equally as sort of surprised as mine. So I... I you know, I sat in a few counseling sessions as well. I think my ultimate goal was to try to create um, a very calm energy and to try and be attentive. But as with all good counselors, is to try and let him steer me into, you know, opening up about his past. Um, and of course, Mark is just so, he's such a great actor. He gives you so much that it, it, it was easy on the day to react off him. But it was certainly a challenge. You know, when you look at what he has gone through, he's lost his mother, he's an abusive father, doesn't know who his father is, he's grown up with um, a twin brother who's a paranoid schizophrenic, he loses his daughter, he um, ends his marriage. I mean, it's just shocking how much this poor man goes through. Yeah. And speaking of Mark Ruffalo, I mean, he's the guy on the top of the call sheet, and um, I sometimes hear about 
uh, you know, a set is so much better when the, the woman or man on the top of the call sheet really sets the, the tone for the series. And um, I hear that Mark was, was really very collaborative and great to work with. What was your highlight working alongside him and him getting Mark kind of... Is, um, you know, I think Mark has one of those qualities that anybody who meets him, you just feel an instant connection with him. He's, a, he's, a, he's very gentle, he's very wise and... He, you know, he's a master at his craft, but he always makes it look so effortless. You don't feel intimidated by him at all. And the energy on set, which was so necessary for this type of work, where, you know, Derek um, was very keen to create everything in a very natural way, so everything felt very raw and authentic. To have that energy on this particular set, I think, was crucial. Um, you know, he was a delight to work with. He was very humble and very witty, and he always gives you so much in the scene. Yeah. Yeah, that's exactly what I've been hearing about him. I also heard about uh, this show, because I've already interviewed Catherine and um, Rosie. They both mentioned that Derek Sian France is um, very particular about authenticity and creating a bubble with, within which the actors can really go for something. You might do 50 takes and he'll set up a scene that might only be on the TV for 10 seconds. I find that really interesting about him. Uh, what about you? What, what did you find about working with Derek and how he well, is it? you know, Bob, when I grew up, when I grew up, um, we had a lot of Bollywood in the background because my parents yeah. were from India. And I loved it. It's very uplifting. It's very joyous. But the, the, the work that I was totally captivated by, which is very reminiscent of a lot of Derek's work, is um, filmmakers like Ken Loach, like Mike Lee. Um, mm. Their work was just so raw and authentic that as a young girl watching them, I always felt, I couldn't believe these people were actors because it was so real. I felt like I was literally there flying and watching their life. And so that's one of the reasons I was so excited to work with Derek um, because he, he really wants to create an environment and an atmosphere that feels so raw that you are completely in the zone of that character. And it's not as easy, I think, to create as what it sounds like. But what we, you know, we had um, we had a very minimal crew. The crew barely came in for um, hair and makeup touch ups. If something went wrong, you just worked with it in the scene. It's, it's very liberating. He, if you forget a line, you just continue. If you make a mistake or you drop something, it all just becomes part of the scene or part of the character. Um, and it's a very exhilarating experience. It's daunting, and we do make mistakes. Um, but like Derek always used to reassure us, there's no right or wrong. So. It, you know, it was fun to do, and it, for me, it felt like a dream come true working on with someone like Derek. Sounds wonderful. Because it sounds like any profession when you're working with a leader who lets you kind of fly a bit and be yourself and strive for something better. That sounds amazing, and that's why this show, for me at least, um, was so um, devastating. It's so, so effective. That's my highlight when I look back at the series, and when everyone sees the last two episodes, they'll agree with me. It's incredible. What was it? What, what, when you look back on that series, what would you say is your fondest memory or your highlight from it? I have so, well, so many. Um, I think the process for me, the process mm. that were, you know, jumping into the first day when we had about an 18 page scene and we had no uh, read throughs, no line runs, no discussions. Mark hadn't even come into the room, to the office. Uh, wow. I remember feeling incredibly nervous, of, you know, not even having the chance to run 18 lines. Um, but when you do a few takes and you, you start getting to the rhythm of it, you're completely in this different zone. It's very hard to explain, Rob. You're just, you're like, on a, on a, I don't know, you just become that character for those few minutes. It's, wow. um, it's intoxicating. Yeah, that sounds really cool. And then, um, did you realize that you would have this? airing at the same time as Run? Would that, was he, was I that had, even a problem? <laughs> I, no, I, I didn't, I had no clue. I was surprised because the characters, uh, the genres and the characters are so different. Yeah. Um, but, you know, you know what our business is like. It's feast or famine. Um, yeah. It, it can end at any time. And so right. you just run with it and enjoy it. That's it. And like, so we won't see you for a little while and then all of a sudden you're all over HBO, which is kind of cool. <laughs> and we enjoyed having very two extremes, extremely different characters on at the same time. Has that been an enjoyable experience for you? Yeah, I mean, look, HBO is one of the best um, channels that you can be on, so I feel very honoured to have done two very different shows. Um, yeah. Yes, it's, it's been nice. And um, 
what, what, I mean, she, obviously now Fiona is gone unless she comes back as a ghost, but I haven't, because I haven't seen her yet. I'm a bit behind. I don't think she does. Um, as we said earlier, unlike Patel, she's not controlled, not empathetic, <laughs> and she's extremely manipulative, and she looked like a lot of fun. So talk us through that character and how much fun you were having. Yeah, that was that, that's something that just came up very quickly. And, I, um, you know, I love Merritt Lee, but I've worked with her, um, admire John Old Gleason's work and, of course, the team behind being bad, the three guys that were doing it. Yeah. But I love, the, uh, I love the premise of these two people meeting up after 17, two lovers, ex-lovers meeting up after 17 years, and along comes mm. this character who is absolutely determined to separate them and is incredibly mm. manipulative. And I thought, you know, it would be fun to play something like this. Um, I mean, it's a little bit of a psycho as well, and I've never played somebody like that. So I thought it would be fun. I think I would have found it problematic if I was filming I Know This Much Is True and Run um, around the same period. I think that would have been very challenging. Yeah. <laughs> um, I don't know, maybe I'm wrong, but when I was watching your performance and looking into your eyes, I felt like you were really enjoying being a psycho. Like, and I was... <laughs> you were, weren't you? I don't think you were. I think you were. Well, I, I could see so many things. I could read so many things into that comment. Um, know. You know, it's interesting you say that thing about the eyes because the um, director and Vicky, um, when I initially started playing it, kept coming up to me and saying, find something, I want to see something in the eyes, I want to see a bit of madness in the eyes. I was like, no, 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 she's not mad. No, no, no. Just, let's just see something going on. And often, you know, having played something like Linda for six years where everything is so controlled, yeah. it's difficult to let go. And so I, I feel like I was completely under their direction and I was experimenting with things and I was always worried I was doing, I was going over the top. So yes, even when I watch it now, I feel like, oh gosh, I look like I'm really a little bit crazy. Yeah. <laughs> um, I, th I did enjoy it. It was fun to play. Because she's so nice at first and they're going on that shopping trip and I just, and then, and then we find out she's this crazy person and um, I'm sorry to say, but I kind of sided with her. I was like, yes, Fiona, get the bunny. And go. Well, I, I, listen, well, listen, she, you know, in her head, she was doing the right thing. Let's be clear. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Ruby was married with kids. And um, <laughs> he felt that Donald would, not Donald, <laughs> yeah. Billy, Billy yeah. would, um, you know, get over her quickly. And I think she felt she was protecting um, Ruby's character. So in her head, she was doing the right thing. Yeah, because the other two are super impulsive and have left their lives to go on a train and to kind of um, make out on the train. And I'm like, no, I'm I'm on Team Fiona. But then she gets thrown out of a window and then she gets spiked, which is which is really um uh, you know crazy. But what an amazing thing to do for me, I can tell you that jumping out the window and falling on the rig that was that was one of the most challenging things I think I've ever had to do. Yeah, I can imagine. Yes. Uh, the insurance must be sky high on the on the Archie Punjabi. Um, let's not kill the policy. Um, so, so I'm glad. I'm really glad that that happened. You know, it reminds me, as you mentioned, uh, you played Kalinda Sharma on The Good Wife. That was one of my favourite shows back in the day when I got the pleasure of interviewing you in 2012 when I was only 17 years old. And um, now, you know, you're back. You're 47, and, right? <laughs> you know, and you haven't aged a day. And in fact, you've probably gone backwards. And what I'm really <laughs> fascinated about is that um, you won the Emmy and then I, I was reading about you and people have said that you were the first person of Asian descent to win an acting Emmy and I thought no that that can't be the case so I had a yeah, good I thought I, thought I was um, you know what's really interesting I was at the time I had no idea and I don't think most people did until five or six or several years later when the whole diversity sort of debate started, you know, people were talking about it. So I had, I had no idea. Um, yeah. Yeah, it was, a, it was, a, I mean, it's a great night. Oh, I know, right? And I, like you walked, I remember you went up onto the stage and you were completely shocked and um, your castmates hugged you and they were so happy for you and you were just like, this is going to be so great for my career. Thank you so much. Like you were just completely bamboozled. It's an unforgettable moment because as we were talking offline, it was a bit of a surprise. There was you and Christine yeah. in your category. Yeah. And that oh, very so much happened to have one active in the there, there were a group of incredible actresses in that category. And my name wasn't really even on Gold Derby. <laughs> <Not> <laughs> 
<laughs> you pay up for it in subsequent years so after. Oh, yeah. um, yeah. no, and I also, to be honest, Rob, I didn't, you know, I was so busy in doing the show that I hadn't even got publicists. I hadn't really done the rounds. I hadn't been introduced to anybody. So um, that's probably one of the reasons why I wasn't covered as well. And so for me to be nominated in one of the toughest categories for the actors, yeah. being actress yeah. is so incredibly tough. And to be nominated by people from the industry, I was, like, I felt I won the Emmy just with the nomination. Yeah. Um, and I thought there's, you know, the other actresses are so fabulous to be in a group with them is great. But right. it was amazing. I think most actors yeah. are surprised when they win that because, you know, on the night anything can happen. So I think every the average actor is kind of shocked or surprised. When I mean, them. speaking of your co-star Merit Weaver, um, when she won, she yeah. was so shocked that she just said thank you and walked off. So, I mean... <laughs> That's the best end speech ever, isn't it? Ever. At least you got to speak. Um, but again, like the first um, uh, actor of Asian descent, that will always be you now. And that's pretty cool. First what? Oh, yeah, that's all right. I'll take that. I'll take yeah, that. Yeah, cool. Take it, take it. Why do you think, <laughs> when we talked um, ages ago, I asked you this question. I'm going to ask you again, see if it's changed. Why do you think Kalinda is so beloved? And I'll, I'll give you an example. I was having dinner with my parents last night, and, I, and they just happened to say, oh, how's your interviews going? I'm like, yeah, good. I've got Archie Punjabi tomorrow morning. I'm my mum straight away. Oh, my God. I love her. Kalinda. And I'm like, mum, she hasn't been on The Good Wife for years. But they still, <laughs> but they still associate yeah. you with Kalinda. Why? Why is she so beloved? I, think, I just think she was, you know, we're talking about 2012. Um, I think everything about her was just so unique. It was so groundbreaking for the time. She was yeah. a woman of colour. She was playing an investigative role, which I think up until that point in TV was often played by a much older man. Um, yeah. She was very sexual, but in a way that that still earned respect from men and women, and I don't know whether that had been done before. And she was obviously bisexual, which, again, yeah. another, you know, now there are a lot more um, characters that, you know, are gay or, or bisexual, um, but in, at that time, they really weren't. So I think everything about her was quite unique, and people probably just, you know, found it um, somebody different. Yeah. I think that's probably the best way to put it. And uh, she was groundbreaking. She was bad. She was bad. I mean, she. Yeah. You know, and that, very, the methods that she used were. Yeah. Highly questioned. She was, she was. Yeah, she was complicated, and that's. She's very complicated. You don't see that a lot. We do these days, but maybe back in the day we didn't. Everyone was either black or white. But Clinda had this grey area, and we liked that. She was mysterious. Yeah. She was sexy. She was interesting, and all that stuff. And that's why. That's why I, I like her. Great range of leather boots and leather jackets. Oh, Can't, right. forget that. Can't forget those boots and that and that. Oh yeah, I mean that was amazing. But look, um, we've loved seeing you on our TVs. Uh, you you've done some great work on the Fall and so many other great things in the UK and in the US. Hopefully your next project, you don't get thrown out of any windows, cars, buildings, that you just stay safe. But um, but thanks so much for your time today. Yeah, and it's been a pleasure to you speaking to you. You're the first person I ever spoke to all those years back. And you were always very welcoming. I was very nervous. I hope it won't be too long before we speak again. I hope so. I'm not waiting another eight years for this, okay? <laughs> and you haven't aged this all either. Yeah, well, thank you. I appreciate that. But, you know, you're lying and you're a good actor. <laughs> um,